Okay, and we're live. Let me let the settings finish getting loaded up and wait just a few seconds for any attendees to who see the, see the notification. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little extra long introducing you to give people time to, uh, to drift in here at the start. Um, but okay, I think with that, we're, we're rolling. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, very much appreciated to, to see you uh, as, as I've, I've heard people say at events like this before. I'm glad, to, I'm glad to see that you decided that day one wasn't a waste of your time and you're back for day two. So uh, thanks very much. We have another really exciting uh, day worth of, of, of talks lined up, lined up for you here today. Uh, commencing with, uh, oh, I'm getting an echo of my own ah, i'm sure it'll go away it's fine um I'll extra long introducing you to give people whoa time to, uh, no i'm getting a in here at the start i'm getting a bad um, echo but okay i think with that we're we're rolling uh welcome where is back, that everybody sorry one second i do not know where this echo is coming uh, from as, as I've, I've heard people oh say, christoph do you have do you have crowdcast open on your computer it wasn't a waste of your time ah, maybe. maybe i think yes. i think you're watching your own broadcast in tape delay let me see. Commencing with. So I need to disconnect here. Um, How about that? There we go. Okay, that is what it was. Um, cool. All right. Um, so yes, uh, while we get the screen sharing back, good. Okay, here we are. Uh, so commencing with our second keynote speaker. So we'll kick off every day with a keynote, as you've seen on the schedule. And, and we have with us uh, uh, this morning or afternoon, depending on your, on your time zone, uh, Christophe Malater of the uh, Université de Québec à Montréal, uh, who is there, uh, Canada Research Chair in Philosophy of the Life Sciences and uh, Professor in the uh, Département de Philosophie. Uh, has done some fantastic work over the last few years, really a, really a, a pioneering group uh, working there at, uh, at UCAM on the use of topic modeling for uh, purposes of history of philosophy, philosophy of science, history of philosophy of science, et cetera. Uh, and he'll be talking to with us today on uh, the topic modeling of multilingual non-parallel corpora. So how we might think about applying machine translation to a philosophy of science corpus. And so with that, I will, uh, I'll give you the floor. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Charles uh, and Luca for having me um, uh, with you. There's just been a great conference uh, uh, so far. So um, I'm really happy to, uh, to be with you today. Uh, my talk is about, uh, will be about exploring um, uh, multilingual non-parallel corpora, um, especially with topic modeling and uh, with a special focus here on the philosophy of science for uh, philosophy of science corpus. And this is actually a problem that we stumbled upon uh, when we uh, targeted our, um, uh, our corpus of, and fellow philosophy of science journals, we were not expecting actually um, to have to face a multilingual uh, corpora, but, 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 we, but we did. So we had to find solutions. And what I'm going to share with you uh, today is some of the solutions that we implemented um, so my talk is going to be probably quite heavy on the methodological side, but I will also share with you some of the results that we, um, that we got. So um, the uh, background question is, uh, how can we uh, map disciplines through time in particular? How can we identify the research topics of a discipline such as philosophy of science, if we're interested in, in philosophy of science and the history of philosophy of science? Um, and how can we investigate changes of this discipline through, uh, through time? Of course, uh, we can use expert analysis, and this is the usual methodology uh, of closed reading, by which uh, we look at text in detail, and uh, with uh, expert knowledge, we make sense of all this, uh, the literature, and uh, we're able to reconstruct a uh, history of the discipline with its main uh, research themes, um, uh, opening and closing through, uh, through time. But of course it is very time consuming, especially if the corpus becomes larger and larger and, and larger. So another approach um, is to use computational text mining methods. This is something that we also uh, saw yesterday, um, uh, Cody, in the presentation of Cody O'Toole, uh, for instance, 
in which there were uh, different approaches being used to um, investigate a large, uh, large corpus. Uh, and one of the uh, uh, possibilities to use topic modeling algorithms over very large corpora as a form of distant reading to be able to um, collect, somehow um, uh, make emerge the main topics that uh, are present in a corpus uh, through, uh, through time and how they evolve uh, through time. So one of the advantages is of these methods is that they uh, can tackle very large uh, corpora, a huge amount of text, um, another advantage is that they're bottom driven, uh, bottom up, they're data driven uh, somehow. So they um, may help set an empirical basis, you know, for um, otherwise uh, what might be uh, informal claims. Um, and so here, this is what we um, uh, intended to do on the uh, full text content of uh, eight major philosophy of science journals from the 1930s up till uh, 2017. Uh, but uh, Sometimes, maybe even more often than we think, corpora are multilingual. Uh, in our particular case, um, we found out that 6% of the articles were published actually in German, Dutch, or French. Um, and so that was not so much as, as a percentage of the full corpus, but um, the uh, non-English articles still represented about 54% of articles before World War II. So the first option is uh, when you have such a corpus could be to exclude all in the non-English articles and just focus on the English articles. And this is what we did in the, in the first study. But then we thought that, uh, you know, we were probably missing something uh, in the pre-World War II period in which we had so many uh, non-English texts. Uh, and we wish to include all the articles, including this non-English uh, articles in a subsequent study. But how can we do this? Um, so when you tackle multilingual corpora, there are actually um, two types of multilingual corpora uh, that you need to be aware of uh, and that we, on which we found work in the, uh, in the literature. Um, there are what are called parallel corpora and non-parallel corpora. So parallel corpora include expert translations. Um, texts are available in, uh, in at least two languages or several languages uh, and they're gold, typically gold translations um, uh, between of all the text. An example is the uh, proceedings of the European Parliament, which are available in several languages and they're perfect translations of one another. So we find a lot of work on multilingual corpora that use such uh, corpora as the proceedings of the European Parliament. Um, another form of parallel text uh, include uh, comparable text, but that are not expert translations text in different languages that are supposed to roughly exhibit the same distributions of themes or subjects, though they're not exact translations of one another. And this is what you find in Wikipedia, for instance, in which articles, or entries in French and English talk about the same things, for instance, but they're not ex necessarily exact translations of one another. And then there is a whole other class of multilingual corpora, um, the class of non-parallel uh, corpora, which include texts that are not aligned. And one typical example is uh, articles from journals that accept publications in different languages. And in this case, the articles are never translated in, in several languages, right? You have articles that are found in different languages uh, only once. Uh, so we uh, had to tackle, or in our case, non-parallel corpora. So what do you do if you want to do some uh, topic modeling, which are the type of solutions that are there in the literature for uh, multilingual corpora, generally speaking? Uh, we've seen that there is a, um, a lot of things that have been developed in particular for uh, parallel corpora. Uh, topic modeling algorithms have been um, uh, developed to carry out topic uh, modeling across parallel texts by aligning the topics at a sentence or document level. Um, and uh, we were somehow puzzled to find about this, but the, the interest of this, of doing this type of topic modeling is actually to, um, <clears throat> to help improve uh, machine translation um, through uh, this types of uh, uh, topic uh, um, uh, matching, uh, parallel topic uh, model. So this is something that we're, that, that, we had to be aware of, but this is not something that could in any way help us with our, um, uh, with our problem. For non-parallel corpora, you need to have a specific 
language bridging solutions that are somehow implemented. And so the first solution is to use um, uh, what we can call advanced uh, topic modeling algorithms that include um, such language bridging solutions. And uh, in that particular case, several um, uh, algorithms have been uh, developed or uh, proposed, such as uh, some that include multilingual dictionaries directly uh, in, inside themselves or other lexical resources. Others uh, use concept trees, uh, for instance, uh, inferred from WordNet or based on user input. So others use a combination of partial text alignment and lexical resources. Quite sophisticated uh, stuff indeed. Uh, the objective being to be able to carry out a topic model on multilingual non-parallel text without having any translation uh, in, in, in between, but using, uh, you know, bridges like dictionaries and so on to, uh, to be able to make the, uh, the connections between the uh, topics in one language and topics in another uh, language. Another solution is on the other way to use uh, what I say, uh, what I call advanced machine translation uh, and um, uh, together with uh, monolingual, very simple or vanilla topic modeling tools. Uh, and this has also been investigated in the literature and uh, there we found two options, two ways of doing it, uh, just to do the machine translation on just the specific terms uh, that are typically present in a, a term document matrix. In other words, in other words you not translate through a, a, a machine translation uh, the entire corpus, but uh, you would just filter out all the words uh, and just send the words for translations um, uh, once they've been aggregated throughout all your, uh, your corpus. Uh, but another option that has been investigated more recently is to do the machine translation of the complete texts and to have full text uh, translation. This has been assessed recently in the context of parallel text by De Vries and colleagues. Uh, looking at specifically at the European Parliament uh, cor uh, corpus. It has also been assessed for studies based on linguistic inquiry word counts by some, uh, by some other teams. Uh, and we found this a quite attractive uh, so solution um, to implement, but our, our case still is that we did not have um, uh, parallel texts to check uh, for the translation. So we had to devise ways of checking for the, uh, the, the quality of the translation somehow, even without having uh, the golden translation you know, to, uh, to check against. So we, as I said, we opted uh, for the second solution, especially because um, in, in, in our mind, it, it provided an advantage the other solutions did not, which was uh, that it provided a possibility to have access to the article content in, uh, in English. And, I, I don't know about you, but um, I can read French. <laughs> this is no problem. My German is very rough and my Dutch is non-existent. So having access to the full text was uh, somehow a, a great advantage to be able to make sense of, um, of some of the results of the, of the analysis. So this is one of the um, main advantages that we see to this solution. We uh, used machine translation uh, with uh, Google Translate uh, following what had been done by De Vries and colleagues, also for consistency and to show that uh, you know, this top solution that they tested on one parallel corpus could also be implemented on a non-parallel cor uh, corpus. Um, and we used very simple, plain, vanilla LDA topic model, the most basic form that is very well known and very, and, and very robust. And then on top of that, we did further analysis with uh, ad hoc codes, and I'll, uh, I'll go into that as well. So um, remember that our corpus is non-parallel, and so contrary to what had been done before with uh, multilingual um, uh, corpora and machine translation, we did not have the possibility of, of, of checking with, uh, with algorithms the quality of uh, the translation. So we had to devise a new way of assessing this uh, trans uh, translation quality uh, problem. Um, so in the talk here, there are, I hope you, you will understand now, there are two intertwined questions, a, methodolog a methodological question that we stumbled upon when we wanted to answer a history of philosophy question. So the methodological question is, how can one tackle non-parallel multilingual corpora 
and evaluate the machine translation quality. And this is where we um, devise what we call a semantic topology preservation test. Um, and then there is a history of philosophy question, a content question, uh, so to speak. What are the research topics investigated in the philosophy of science and how have they changed through time? Um, so in, uh, with this, um, uh, here our main results is to do a complete uh, uh, topic model of the complete corpus uh, and to bring new insights from the non-English text, uh, notably pre-World uh, War II. Um, so the uh, structure of my talk will be to, um, very classical, to uh, uh, present to you the data, um, then the methods, um, then the results, and then we'll go to a, a discussion period, uh, depending upon how much time we, uh, we have left, and then we'll have, uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions. So the data itself, as I said, it's a, a philosophy of science uh, corpus, it includes eight major journals of the philosophy in the philosophy of science, so the uh, BJPS, uh, Erkenntnis, uh, the European Journal for the Philosophy of Science, um, International Studies in the Philosophy of Science, the Journal for General Philosophy of Science, uh, Philosophy of Science Studies, uh, Part A, and Sentez. So you can see here the publication periods, uh, the number of articles in the different languages, and it's a uh, so. Uh, most articles, like uh, 15,900, are in, uh, in English, but there were still quite a lot in German. Uh, some in Dutch and some in French. Uh, the German articles were mostly uh, from Erkenntnis, uh, pre-World War, uh, pre War II, and from the Journal for General Philosophy of Science um, from the 1970s through the 1990s. Uh, journal articles in Dutch and French were mostly from uh, Synthes uh, and typically before the uh, 1940s or 1960s uh, altogether. So, all in all, this is a, a, a corpus uh, that includes nearly uh, 17,000 uh, full text uh, art articles. This is the, um, how the, the number of articles um, uh, evolved uh, uh, over time. So you see in shades of orange here, uh, the English articles of the uh, different journals. Um, uh, these are a number of articles. So you see um, uh, how Synthes typically came to become one of the uh, uh, journals with the highest number of publications today. But you see also in blue, the non-English articles um, and how significant they were uh, before uh, World War II. Um, and then uh, how some of them appeared also in the 1970s and, and 90s. These were uh, articles from the uh, Journal for General Philosophy of Science. So before World War II, essentially non-English articles, quite a lot of them in uh, Centes and Erkenntnis, and then later on in the uh, GJPS. So um, um, that's about the, uh, the, the, the corpus itself. Now the, the methods, uh, we implemented here a, a research design following two main stages. So um, stage A is more uh, concerns the translation and stage B concerns more the topic modeling itself and the, uh, the content of the corpus. So um, stage A includes all the uh, translation issues of the non-English articles into English and the assessment of the translation quality, especially for the purposes of bag of word textual analysis. And stage B is the uh, topic modeling of the entire corpus. It's analysis both from synchronic and diachronic perspective in its comparison with the previous topic modeling that we had done on the English only portion of the uh, corpus. So this is the overall research design. In orange, you see all the different steps involved in the um, uh, translation and translation uh, quality assessment. And in blue, all the topic modeling work. And in gray, uh, that was the methodology followed for a previous topic model. So we'll go in some of the uh, details uh, here, state step by step, uh, just to make sure you know, that you're fully aware what went uh, on behind the scene, so to speak. So uh, what did we do for the machine translation itself? Um, uh, we took all journal articles and their metadata that we had organized into a dead frame. We um, used uh, automatic language detection to uh, detect the article language. We then split the corpus into um, uh, four subcorpora, English, German, Dutch, and French. 
and each non-English uh, corpus was sent to Google Translate by chunks uh, of about 25,000 characters uh, was, uh, as requested by uh, Google Translate. The translation results were then reassembled into articles and then back, uh, the whole of it uh, assembled back into a, um, a data frame. Um, we carry out a manual quality assessment. Uh, in this case, each non for each non language uh, non English language uh, corpus, ten texts were randomly selected, and for each we inspected their first five hundred words uh, of the original uh, document and the translations. In particular, we scored the text for three types of problems that might have possible impact on computational textual analysis. Uh, we found out that there were spelling issues in the original text, um, mo mostly resulting from OCR and encoding issues. Um, uh, and some of these issues, uh, spelling issues in the original text, uh, might have also induced issues in the translation, so they were present in both. We looked for inaccurate terms that were introduced by the translation, so translation mistakes, so to speak. Uh, and we look um, at uh, OCR and encoding issues that were present uh, in the original text and that were corrected through a machine translation. So improvement in the text quality uh, through machine translation. Um, but that was done only on sample text and, and we wanted to have an, uh, some form of assessment, of quality assessment over the entire corpus, something that could be uh, implemented algorithmically. So um, to provide a systematic translation assessment over the whole non-English corpus, we chose to compare the relative distances between documents before translation and after translation. Um, uh, the rationale is that documents that are close to one another in the uh, word vector space before translation should also remain close to one another after translation. Um, and if this is the case, then bad word um, algorithms should provide similar types of results if they were to be run on the original text or if they were to be run on the translated text. Um, and this is um, what, we, uh, uh, what we call the, uh, uh, the, the topology preservation test, because in other ways, uh, in other words, it means measuring how similar the structure or the topology of the document term spaces is the same in the original uh, corpus or in the translated uh, corpus. So uh, we devised this topology preservation test. Um, more specifically, this test consists in constructing the document term matrices of the three subcorpora in their original languages, so Dutch, German, and French, and of the same thing for the three uh, translations. Uh, we constructed the uh, document term matrices directly uh, without any uh, pre-processing of the text. Therefore, the dimensionality was extremely high. To reduce the dimensionality of all six document term matrices, we used single value decomposition. Um, we then calculated the document document matrices uh, within their respective word, spa word, word vector spaces for all six uh, document term matrices. We use Euclidean uh, distance here. And then we measured when the similarity of the original and the translated distance matrices for each subcorpus. And here we used similarity, metric similarity uh, measures such as Mantel coefficient, Procrustus uh, coefficient, and RV coefficient. And we used these coefficients as indicators of the translation accuracy for bag of word analysis. Now, the uh, methods for topic modeling itself. Um, here, this is more straightforward. Um, uh, the first stage typically is to do a, a corpus preprocessing. Once you have assembled all the uh, English and all the translated subcorpora uh, together in, in, a, in the data frame, Oops. we um, do a word tokenization uh, with part of speech tagging and limitization to reduce the number of uh, word variants uh, with your again, well known uh, package of tree tagger with a pen tree bank. Uh, we did a word filtering here, uh, removing stop words and uh, also based on, on frequencies and that resulted in a reduced lexicon of about 24,000 terms in all articles of the, uh, of the corpus. After the pre-processing, we um, implemented the topic modeling itself. As said, uh, we used a, uh, an LDA uh, algorithm uh, following Bly and, uh, and, and colleagues. So the, uh, 
one of the classical uh, Python packaged with the Gibbs samplings. And we did this with a number of topics of 25, as in the previous topic modeling that had been done. The advantage is uh, that this is a fairly coarse grain uh, view that is uh, that we found quite suited uh, to be able to, when it comes to describing very general trends in the discipline over nearly a century. Uh, but of course, more, much more detailed uh, topic modeling can be, uh, can be implemented. Um, the results that uh, are obtained from this topic modeling stage are um, the 25 topics, uh, which are probably probability distributions over the lexicon and um, the probability distributions of the topics over all articles in the corpus. Once we have this, we did a topic interpretation by examining the most probable words in each topic and by retrieving the articles in which a given topic was in turn the most probable. Uh, we also grouped the topics into clusters on the basis of our own expert knowledge uh, so as to facilitate the, the handling of the topics. And uh, we also use topic correlation within corpus documents um, to do this, uh, this uh, manual clustering. Um, in a subsequent step, we compared this uh, synchronic topic modeling with the previous topic model done only on the uh, English um, uh, text. To do this, we assess the similarity between the uh, new topics and the similarity of the new topics with the, the, the previous topics. And we used a uh, Euclidean pairwise distance um, uh, between their relative, um, their respective probability distribution vectors uh, for all words that were shared uh, in between the two uh, uh, lexicons. The result of this uh, step is a, um, uh, a distance matrix between the new topics and the previous topics uh, that shows the alignment or non-alignment of, of the topics and the effect of including um, uh, the uh, non-English corp uh, non corpora into the, uh, uh, in, into the study. As a sixth step, uh, we uh, did a diachronic uh, analysis and also a journal uh, by journal analysis that was simply done by adding uh, publication years and journal metadata to the model and, ag and aggregating the uh, topic probability distributions in articles either published in specific time periods or published by specific uh, uh, journals or even uh, both. The result of the step is a diachronic topic model that shows how the topics evolve through time, um, as well as journal profiles and even journal profiles evolving through, uh, through time. This will all show. We also um, did further comparisons with the previous topic model on the, uh, uh, on the journal profiles uh, and the diachronics. So here, are, these were more qualitative comparisons, not algorithmic. Um, but this led us to uh, investigate also more in detail so the pre-World War II uh, period for which the proportion of non-English articles was significant. And I'll share some of the results with you uh, also here. All right, so this is, for the, uh, this is for the methods itself. So now the results. What do you get? Um, uh, first for the machine translation. So very simply, um, the outcome output of the machine translation was the English translations of all the three corpora. The peculiarity was that we had a high number of OCR and encoding issues, especially in the pre-1960s um, uh, documents. We found out that, that all the documents that we had uh, gotten uh, from JSTOR typically had, were plagued with uh, uh, question marks and were, uh, were with OCR issues. So, l'association française entend de mon histoire should actually be l'association française uh, here, this sounds pretty it should actually be entendement, it should actually be histoire. So uh, what we found out is um, when we looked at the question marks, uh, this is something that we could do algorithmically. Um, we could uh, measure, uh, count the number of question marks, either inside words or outside words in the English corpus or in the uh, non-English uh, subcorpora. And we found out, uh, this is what shows here, that the translation actually reduces on average 80% um, of the uh, question marks found in the, in the text. So we didn't know exactly where these question marks were, were reduced uh, and how. Um, and this is why we looked up so um, uh, 
at the text by, with some close reading and some manual quality instructions. So this is an example of uh, comparison here on just a very sm simple paragraph of a text by Louis Rougier, La Relativité de la Logique, published in, by Air Cantonis, in Air Cantonis in 1939. This is the original text that we got from uh, JSTOR. And as you see, there are many issues here with question marks. Uh, and this is a machine translation. And so as you can see, there were issues uh, that were present in the original text that would have been, would have impacted the uh, topic modeling if we had done the topic modeling just in French here um, that were corrected by machine translation. There were others like here that were not corrected, that stayed. And there were still some that were, you know, some like proposition here that was uh, translated by proposals. This is not really accurate. This is a, what we call a translation, uh, you know, translation mistake. So you have here the three types of anomalies that we, we identified, anomalies that were present that got corrected, anomalies that were present that did not, that stayed somehow, and um, things that were not anomaly, that, but anomalies that were introduced by the, uh, by the translation. Um, we quantified this over um, the sample text, and what we found out is the, all the three types of anomalies that, um, uh, on average, the translation, machine translation, left out three percent, so three words per hundred words in each corpus um, of, of anomalies were, were left. Um, translations introduced about 1.4 words per 100 words of text uh, of uh, mistakes uh, or, or yeah, issues in translations, distortions. And uh, machine translation corrected about 9.4 words uh, out of 100 words. So um, all in all, it's a net, uh, if you will, an, a net benefit of about 8% uh, uh, of improvements of the machine translation uh, in the quality of the, uh, of the text. So we're really um, uh, uh, positively uh, surprised by the, uh, this machine translation uh, step, uh, at least from this uh, qualitative perspective. Now we looked at the um, uh, topology preservation test itself. Um, uh, these are the results of the different uh, metric similarity coefficient. Uh, here you see the mantle, procrustus, and uh, RV coefficients for uh, the three languages. And as you can see, uh, the uh, results are extremely good. Uh, I mean, uh, over 0.98 uh, for, for French uh, in the range of 0.9 for Dutch and, and, and German here. Um, so uh, not only, you know, the uh, uh, on the sample text that we studied, we found out uh, significant improvements uh, in the translations, very, I mean, very good translations and even improvements in the quality of the, uh, the text. Uh, but overall also, um, it seems that the uh, uh, machine translations uh, preserved extremely well the uh, ways the documents are, are, are grouped together uh, in their different vector spaces. So that gave us a, a very good confidence, very good level of confidence in this uh, machine translation step. Now, results of the topic modeling itself, um, uh, once we're confident uh, about the, uh, the machine translation, um, uh, the results are first a set of topics, as I said, 25 topics uh, were found by, the, uh, by the, the, the model itself. So a topic is nothing but a, you know, a, a probability distribution over the lexicon. So here you see the top 10 words, um, uh, uh, which are the words that are the most likely or the most probable uh, in this particular topic, in the first topic. And the name here is the name that we assign to that particular topic once we interpreted the topic uh, on the basis of the set of words and on the basis of the uh, top articles in which the, uh, the, the topic was most uh, likely. So here you see the, the uh, 25 labels with the 25 uh, bags of words, uh, top 10 words, but don't, don't forget eh, that the, uh, in, in, in the LDA, a topic model is not just a bag of words, it's probability distribution of uh, these words. So some of these words are actually much more uh, likely to be uh, uh, found in, in, in uh, given topics. Um, what we 
so what, another way to look at the topics it's, is to look at um, um, how topics relate to one another uh, in documents. So if this uh, graph here, this network, uh, represent the topics, nodes are topics, uh, and edges, uh, the thickness of the edges is proportional to the um, correlation of topics within uh, documents. So you see that some topics tend to be uh, often found together in uh, specific documents uh, throughout corpus. So here we see a first, let's say, cluster of um, uh, topics that are about um, uh, formal uh, themes like language, mathematics, truth, sentence. We can, we can imagine that this is something about philosophy of language, uh, logic, uh, typically philosophy of mathematics. Um, and this is exactly what we find when we go to some text um, and when we, uh, we look at the text in which these topics are the most present. Another set of topics concerns uh, is more epistemology oriented, so concerns knowledge, arguments, or scientific theory. Uh, there is a, a, another third topic here that uh, concerns, uh, let's say, um, uh, confirmation, problem of induction, experiment, but then probability. Um, somehow in between, there is a, a, a single topic here, uh, which is more about agent um, um, uh, game theory, agent decision, uh, these types of uh, things. Um, a, um, uh, another topic here is about, so I'm jumping, jumping by order, A, B, C, D, E, uh, here is about um, uh, bio, philosophy of biology with the topic evolution and philosophy of mind and the neurosciences. Uh, with uh, three different topics here, one about perception, another one about mind, another one about specifically neurosciences. Uh, we have three topics somehow in the middle here that are maybe some of the, what we could say, the core topics in the philosophy of science about explanation, causation, and here in pro property, uh, there is a lot of, uh, uh, there are a lot of articles about, for instance, uh, supervenience, emergence, um, this type of things. Um, then we have a little cluster here. There is more about philosophy of physics with um, something which more quantum, philosophy of quantum physics, but also some relativity found in there, as well as another cluster which is more about atoms, you know, chemistry uh, that we named uh, particles. And then finally, a cluster which is more of a social historical nature um, that includes um, you know, like topic classics in which and one finds um, uh, classical authors who chance in uh, like Galileo or Dick, uh, or um, or is it Newton uh, type of uh, type of investigations, um, uh, and then history or philosophy in which you have um, let's say articles that are about philosophy of science, but that involve uh, classical authors such as uh, Kant uh, or Descartes. And then there is a, a topic social, which uh, involves more um, say social uh, aspects of science uh, typically. So this is one way of looking at the, at the topics. I'm very quickly going through, the, uh, through them. Uh, what we built is a, um, a, a map, a topic visualization uh, tool that makes it possible to look at the, all the details because there's just so much information here that I cannot convey the whole of it uh, just in the presentation. Um, uh, this is a, a, a map here. You see a, a scatter plot of all the documents uh, with their uh, dominant uh, topic. And once you click on a particular uh, uh, document uh, within a specific cluster, you get the details here of the uh, of the article, which is uh, with its uh, probability distribution. You can also select which of the topics you want to display um, uh, in this uh, in this uh, scatter plot, and. Uh, then uh, you can also look at uh, uh, topic details. Um, uh, so if you choose one topic here, you see a word cloud of that particular topic, all the key, the top, uh, the top words here. The top words are again present here, uh, but also uh, in the other topics in which this uh, word is present, the other topics here are uh, listed. So the word selection is, you know, the, uh, one of the top words of the uh, topic evolution, but it's also present with a very smaller, much smaller probability in topic experiment and topic probability uh, confirmation or agent decision, for instance. You know? So this is something 
um, that can be used, this browser can be used to really look at the uh, uh, details of the uh, topic modeling results. Now, um, just remember we uh, uh, wanted to uh, uh, improve or to see how to improve our previous topic modeling with the addition of the uh, non-English text. And so one of the core cool questions that we had is how do the uh, new topics compare to the previous topics? And um, uh, this is a, a, a heat map uh, based on the distance uh, that we measured on the uh, distance between the uh, old topics here and the new topics. Um, the topics are arranged still by cluster. They are, um, uh, the color uh, shades are also representative of the, uh, of the clusters. And as can be seen, um, the, uh, the distance that are the smallest uh, are, are, are in red here. There is a fairly good alignment of the um, uh, new topics with the old topics, but some differences, right? So the introduction of this 6% of non-English text did change a bit the, uh, the topic model. Um, uh, we had, so there was, there was a good alignment of uh, nearly all topic except one uh, topic here for explanation that did not really match properly the, the previous explanation topics. But on the other hand, that particular new topics match better. Uh, this other topic here about uh, uh, game theory, uh, probably because you know, there were models being involved there. Um, would have to investigate that in more details. But on the other hand, that previous topic, the topic here explanation uh, was a better fit for this one than any other uh, here. So it's a, you know, if you look from the new to the old, you don't get a good pairing. But if you look from the old to new, the uh, pairing is maybe a bit better, uh, a bit better here. Um, what we see also is that, um, so the mapping is not exactly the same in the sense that in uh, here, for instance, concerning the uh, cluster of confirmation and probability, we previously had two topics and the new topic model uh, includes three topics, um, but there is a good, you know, good matching of uh, typically that topic to the, uh, to the two other, to the two news, um, to the two new topics here. And same thing for, let's say, philosophy of, uh, of mind and the neurosciences, there were two topics and now there are three topics. And um, uh, philosophy of physics, on the other hand, uh, somehow shrank a bit in the, in the representation, probably meaning that the added uh, non-English non text uh, did not have much philosophy of physics uh, in, in them. Um, and uh, on the other hand, uh, they increased the number of uh, uh, social historical uh, types of topics here because the new topic model includes four topics, whereas there were only three in the previous topic model. So fairly good um, alignment, but still some uh, changes. So what is the uh, now the topic evolution itself? Uh, if we uh, look at the uh, diachronic view of the, uh, of the topic model, you see uh, how the topics uh, evolved here through time. So you see on the uh, uh, x-axis, the different time periods from 1930 up to 2017. Uh, the um, x-axis here is the probability of the uh, topics being found in articles of the given time period. Uh, and the right axis here is the number of articles per time period. And this is the um, uh, shade, of the little lines here. Uh, the dark dotted line is the total number of articles and the uh, gray dotted line is the number of English uh, on the articles. So you see that you know, it was really pre-World War II that uh, there were some uh, major additions as well as here uh, through the Journal of uh, General Philosophy of Science. So we can analyze the, the trends even at this uh, uh, large uh, scale. Um, so there was a uh, you know, relative significance of topics related to history of philosophy up until the 1960s uh, with a decreasing trend. Uh, and then there were some ups and downs for social aspects of science, typically. There was, concerning philosophy of language, uh, uh, there was a strong decrease of the language topic that can be seen here. Um, significance and a decrease, probably this is linked to significance and a decrease of the logical empiricism uh, that we see uh, also in the, uh, in, in the corpus here. Um, 
Topics such as uh, confirmation were really significant in the 1960s, uh, but then uh, decreased. Um, there was a slight increase of the topic probability also in the 1960s, and then uh, stagnation. Um, we find an increase in epistemology related uh, topics, can be seen here, all this uh, area, um, in particular through the uh, topics arguments and, and knowledge. And we need to look at more details which types of articles were, were behind that. Um, there is, in terms of philosophy of biology, a, a strong presence. There was a presence of philosophy of biology, you know, before uh, the uh, 19, I said before the 1940s, but actually before the 1950s, uh, and of mine here, uh, a decline, and then uh, more development, especially uh, in the 1970s, especially in the philosophy of biology and the neurosciences, and a relative constancy here of this uh, little you know, single topics, uh, agent decision, uh, all throughout the corpus, though slightly increasing from the uh, uh, 1940s on. Uh, and concerning the, um, uh, the other two, two clusters, there is relative significance of topics related to the philosophy of physics, um, yet a slight decreasing trend in, the, uh, in this uh, same topic since uh, the 1970s. Things are a bit different, you know, depending on uh, which topic you look at. But um, this is a, this is the general trends that we observe here, uh, and there is a regular increase of themes related to uh, causation, explanation, and property all throughout the, the corpus. So these are the broad trends that we can uh, uh, that we can get through the topic model. Um, we can explore in details all this also in the. Um, uh, Web interface that we've uh, that we've built, uh, looking at the different time slices, uh, also looking at specific uh, topics uh, uh, in detail, and um, uh, so as to be able to you know to, to gather more insights because this is again uh, extremely rich in terms of uh, uh, of data. Um, we uh, calculated by using the uh, uh, journal metadata. We calculated the uh, what we call journal profiles, and this is where we see. Um, uh, the uh, uh, topical distribution through all the different journals uh, and the, the uh, different journals being here on the uh, x-axis. So Erkent, Nisentes, the BJPS, Philosophy of Science, CJPS, ISPS, DGPS, and SHPSA part A. And we see that the profiles are, you know, different uh, somehow. Erkent, Nisentes are quite heavy on the uh, formal side, philosophy of language, philosophy uh, logic, uh, also on the epistemology, uh, on the opposite uh, journals such as ISPS, DJPS, or SHPSA are much more, you know, have a higher proportion of the uh, uh, social historical types of uh, types of topics. But even looking at detail, you could look at the details here, and you see that some of the uh, journals have tend to have different emphasis and different uh, on, on on some topics more than on uh, more than on others. Um, we. Um, as I said, uh, we wanted also to compare uh, things before and after adding the uh, non-English uh, corpora. So this is a comparison of the uh, uh, topic model uh, on, done on the uh, complete corpus, the diachronic view, and the previous topic model on the English on the uh, corpus. So of course, uh, one of the main thing was the addition of uh, a time period here, earlier uh, publications that were not present. Uh, what we've seen is a slight shift here of the uh, social historical topics that were, you know, that, that level here that went, uh, that increased uh, at that time period. And also here in the 70s, probably uh, this is due to the uh, inclusion of the uh, uh, non-English text. So uh, they were, they, they were of uh, somehow different nature than the uh, average um, uh, English uh, only uh, document. We did similar comparisons on the uh, journal basis. Uh, so here you see um, the top, the uh, uh, journal diachronic views uh, on the complete uh, uh, corpus. This is the first uh, raw here. So we see Erkentnis, Sentes, and GJPS by time periods uh, when they were published. Uh, so Erkentnis, Erkentnis was published very much as you as you may know, before World War II, then was interrupted uh, by the war and only recovered in the 1970s. 
uh, centers uh, was uh, published before World War II and got interrupted, republished, and reinterrupted again. And the GJPS only started in the 1970s. What we see is the um, I mean, so are, you can compare the, pre the, the, the new uh, topic model with the uh, previous ones at the level of, uh, of journals. And we see some changes for edition of new time periods, but we see also that some of the topics actually for our uh, increased here, the topics on philosophy, logic, and, and, and language uh, increased in share compared to what they were before. On the other hand, there was something, yeah, the, the trend went the other way. Uh, with synthesis, uh, in which there were few social historical um, uh, uh, topics being present, and there were more of these uh, topics in the subsequent um, in subsequent modeling. And then we also observed some changes for GDLPS. Um, but uh, we thought that that was <coughs> uh, very interesting to look at the pre-World War II period, especially in Erkenes and Sintes, as we saw that some of the uh, impacts of uh, adding the new text, non-English text, were the strongest before uh, World War II. So we looked at um, uh, author publications and um, throwing in authors, were able to compute the um, average contributions of authors during a specific time period. So they, in this particular case, this is for all articles published before World War II, up until actually 1941. And um, um, so this depicts the uh, proportion, the contribution of each author to a given topic uh, for that period through um, his or her articles. So for instance, what is uh, very noticeable here is the, uh, for Eric Entness, the importance of in bluish, right, of uh, uh, formal topics, uh, philosophy of language and mathematics and logic, um, with a strong contribution by uh, Heisch, by Heisenbach, uh, by Carnap, uh, Neurat, uh, Frank Schlick, uh, Hempel, but also by the uh, Polish uh, logician uh, um This is what we see here. Um, we also see that the, so the strong contributions of who, well, the founders of the uh, uh, Vienna Circle, uh, typic typically. Um, so this is not surprising somehow that we get this type of picture. What is maybe a bit surprising is that some of these uh, authors also contributed to the uh, more general topics uh, called philosophy and, 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 and history. And this is in particular the case, uh, not so much by, for Karna, but for an author like Reichenbach. Reichenbach is all over the place, for instance, you see it's here, here, uh, it is also in philosophy and, and uh, a little bit here in, in history. Neuret also contributed strongly to uh, philosophy and, 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 uh, and history. Um, to get more details on that, one needs to look at the articles also. Uh, and this is what we did here. For instance, we, there is a, this is a sample of 10 articles uh, by some of the main contributors to uh, Akinis during that uh, this uh, pre-World War II period. And we see for, they're just listed by alphabetic order here, these are the contributions and these are the topics and their probability distributions. So we see, for instance, that uh, the logician uh, Ajuti Vix um, uh, in a, a, an article entitled Language and Meaning uh, is, a, you know, has high proportion of topic uh, language here. Um, and uh, on the other hand, we can see, for instance, for uh, Neurat, that uh, here we have three articles by Neurat, that uh, two of them, these two here, are um, very heavy on uh, philosophical language. Uh, they, they are about protocol sentences, uh, about radical physicalism in the real world. On the other hand, uh, this other article uh, about ways of the scientific worldview as really not heavy on this formal topics, but much more heavy on the history, you know, and philosophy, so general uh, type of topics. L looking at synthesis brings a total different picture with a total different set of authors, um, much, much more heavy on the philosophy and uh, historical general type of topics, a little bit on uh, the formal topics, but really not so much, definitely not the same type of picture as, uh, as Erkenntnis in this pre-World War II period. And a radically different set of authors. We see authors such as uh, Schoenmakers and Groot. Uh, they were actually quite prolific uh, authors uh, who contributed much to the uh, topics, philosophy and, and history. 
uh, with very diverse, uh, uh, diverse articles on, on matter and thinking, cosmogony, but also on beauty, on sin, <laughs> among other things. Uh, one of the early collaborators of Sentez, and actually not, not the founder, uh, but uh, yeah, early collaborator, uh, Sean Makers, was a mathematician. Um, but he was also a member of the Theosophical Society, uh, like the founder of the journal. And actually, many of the uh, collaborators of Sentez at that time were also a member of the Theosophical Society, as I found out. It was the case for the Dutch philosopher and mathematician um, Gerrit Manuri, uh, who's here and who contributed also to, most, to some of the formal topics. Um, uh, but that was also the case um, of uh, uh, the uh, German biologist and philosopher uh, Hans Drisch, who is here, as you can see, uh, and um, uh, also of a, um, uh, other um, contributors like uh, Kruzman. I'm looking at my notes here. Uh, Kruzman was also a biologist, uh, admirer of Drisch, and he too was a, a founder of the Theological Society and also a member of the International Society for Significance uh, that um, gathered several other of these early contributors. So um, a very different set of authors, probably with a different mindset, different approach to uh, philosophy of science that is uh, depicted here when we looked at the details of the uh, centers of the, uh, uh, of the pre-World War II um, uh, centers. Again, same type of exercise can be done by looking at some of the, uh, deep, some of the articles and looking at uh, how some of these articles contributed to the different uh, topics. Uh, as I said, for instance, uh, Sean Makers uh, contributed a very diverse range of articles on uh, thought, on beauty, on sin at that time. Uh, Kruisman contributed articles, for instance, for organisms and society, and, and so a little bit uh, here on the biology topics, for instance, uh, and so forth and so forth. Um, I'm going now to uh, the third journal that we thought was interesting to look at in the pre-World War II uh, period, which was the, the third uh, journal published at that time, uh, and it was uh, Philosophy of Science published in English language, and here, again, a different uh, picture with a radically different set of authors, um, we can see a, 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 a picture which is still more dominated by these uh, historical, philosophical, uh, general types of uh, topics, uh, but with a bit more uh, of uh, the formal uh, philosophical language and logic uh, um, uh, topics, uh, but definitely not as much as in uh, uh, Erkenntnis. Authors, uh, some of the main authors included uh, uh, Malisov here. Uh, so um, Malisov was the founder uh, of and the first editor of Philosophy of Science. Um, and so he contributed himself a lot to the early philosophy of science. And this is something different uh, that we saw in Sintes where the founder did not contribute to the early, uh, um, early uh, Sintes. Um, but there were other, so uh, Malisov is present here and many other uh, topics has so written about philosophy of physics, written about, has written about many different things. Uh, he's somehow all over the place. Um, uh, so he, ad he addressed a very broad range of questions. Um, uh, as you can see also philosophy of particles, was it particles and philosophy of uh, even quantum, uh, the, the topic of quantum uh, mechanics here. Um, five other figures uh, also emerge if you look at some of the uh, strongest contributors, for instance, uh, David Miller, who contributed much to uh, philosophy, as well as uh, Charles Hartshorn, Hartshorn, sorry for the pronunciation, uh, known philosopher of religion and uh, metaphysician uh, of the time. Um, on the other hand, logicians such as uh, Louis Katzoff here, uh, or Henry uh, Smith also contribu oops, contributed to um, uh, uh, philosophical language and logic related uh, topics. Um, but as you can see, there is maybe a bit more, um, uh, more uh, it's more cluttered here. There are more contributions uh, that are more scattered through, uh, throughout the different uh, topics. So all in all, and, and so the same exercise can be carried out here, looking at different articles and how these articles contributed to the specific topics at that particular time uh, to see the, the, the rich, richness behind the, uh, the, uh, the model itself. 
So all in all, um, the, uh, this, uh, the addition of the non-English text shows a pre-World War II uh, philosophy of science that is uh, somehow much more nuanced than we had before we just, when we just looked at the uh, English uh, text. It shows very strong also um, specificity of uh, the, uh, the three journals, Eric Anthony Sentes uh, and Philosophy of Science somehow with very different set of authors um, uh, all, all throughout the, uh, the, the, the period. So I'll just take a few minutes maybe to uh, wave in the direction of some of, of the discussion and bring some, uh, some, some topics here for discussion, especially concerning the methods, but also the, uh, the results. Um, what do we get of the usefulness of machine uh, translation for Bible word analysis? Where our results, both the manual inspection and the topology preservation test provide good reasons to trust machine translation for bag of word analysis, such as topic model. Uh, here we have chosen Google Translate services for consistency with uh, previous studies by DeVries, but other machine translation services also offer equally valid uh, solutions. This has been tested by Reda. Uh, machine translation, we found that also is of great help for fixing OCR related or encoding issues. Yeah, this is a, uh, as a, a free benefit of, of, of uh, the machine translation. Um, but interestingly, uh, it preserves word or ordering also. So it should be um, adequate for other analysis, uh, not just bag of word analysis, other analysis that re rely on word ordering in text, such as collocation, co-occurrences, organ sentiment analysis, or even more not, uh, word embedded. Um, the topology preservation test that we uh, uh, proposed is, of course, only a necessary condition for a reliable translation. It's not sufficient per se, so it's not guaranteed that uh, the translation will did work, but it's, it provides a, uh, uh, something com comforting somehow. It increases our level of confidence of the, that, that the translations uh, work well. Uh, and this is actually one of the only things that we can get uh, if you have no reference uh, translation to check uh, the uh, translations against. And this is the case for non-parallel multilingual corpora. Um, so uh, we believe that this is a, uh, an interesting way of uh, you know, systematically checking uh, where the translation went, uh, whether it went well or not so well, uh, without having to look at all the, uh, all the details. About the corpus itself, the, um, what we saw that is that we got more accurate topic modeling, uh, and that was a motivation for including our uh, non-English text. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the, so that was, uh, yes, that was a motivation. Of course, we could say that the, um, um, uh, I mean, the, uh, a comment, a comment that can be done is that we only looked at eight uh, journals uh, and that uh, philosophy of science is published ma in many other places, many other journals, uh, sometimes more specialized ones, depending on scientific disciplines, so philosophy of physics, philosophy of biology, especially um, uh, as time went on and more and more journals um, uh, got uh, funded. Um, there's also a lot of philosophy of science published in uh, numerous monographies and edited volumes, but um, so th all in all, this shows that the, uh, um, it doesn't show, but it, um, uh, it's, it's just a, uh, a, a warning. Of course, the results should be interpreted in light of this corpus related limitation. We only looked at uh, eight journals, but um, uh, we believe that the representativeness of the selected journals, which are among the uh, most central journals publishing general philosophy of science, lends confidence that the topical trends that we observed indeed captured meaningful disciplinary patterns, uh, at least at this, uh, at this level. But of course, comments can be made on the corpus itself. The topic model, uh, there are um, uh, different um, uh, comments that can be made. Of course, we could have chosen different algorithms, but it, we don't believe this would have, diff uh, would have uh, changed much. Um, uh, one of the things that do change a lot, the, the models, is the number of topics. So choosing the number of topics in the topic model is something really crucial. Uh, here we deliberately chose uh, 25 topics as to facilitate comparisons with the previous uh, English-only topic model. Uh, and it, as I said, this valley has the advantage of offering a fairly coarse grain view, uh, which suits the purpose of sketching a disciplinary portrait over the course of, uh, you know, more or less eight, nine decades. Um, but in the previous uh, topic model, we had tested also uh, uh, 
different uh, types of models. So we did by trial and error, uh, RENS, we uh, did topic models with different values of the uh, different values of the number of topics. Some with a smaller, uh, like 12, uh, 15 topics, up to 50, 100, 150, or uh, 200 topics. Uh, and in the end, we settled on the uh, on 25. Um, of course, finer grain topic models, um, like topic models with 100, 150, 200 uh, topics, would offer much more details. This is what we've done in a previous study, the one that we published in uh, in Holpus. But here. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the choice of a topic, the number of topics, choice of granularity, ultimately it depends on your research questions. Um, uh, what is also key is the fact of being able to interpret the topics. Um, and of course, one should always bear in mind that uh, even though uh, LD in topic model is a generative model that builds up topics from the corpora, expert knowledge is always needed to interpret the topics and the results of the, uh, of the model. Um, then a final comment about the philosophy of science itself, the translated uh, text, as we saw, must have affected the early decades of the diachronic topic model and somehow the topical profiles of the uh, three journals, Hurricane Centers and the TJPS. Uh, as we saw, the, uh, this text counted to 6% of the total corpus, but the share rose to 54% before World War II. Um, of course, topic modeling only provides a descriptive view of the topical content of the corpus, but it cannot explain, uh, cannot explain the observed facts. Uh, this is, a, again, an area that a researcher has to fill in with specific knowledge of the field, all that can lend itself to further investigations because there is a wealth of uh, uh, ways in which the data can be uh, further investigated. And you know, as, as uh, possibilities here, the, the changes themselves may due to different factors. They can be researcher driven, they can be journal driven, they can be driven by disciplinary dynamics, they can be driven by extra disciplinary dynamics, but still in science, or they can be driven by extra scientific factors, including funding policies or broader historical or sociological factors. So understanding the whys you know, behind the changes in uh, probably topic probabilities is something that requires uh, definitely further an investigation uh, beyond the topic model. So maybe just to conclude uh, now, I see my time's up. Um, uh, what can we say more generally about computational text mining approaches in, in, in philosophy? I, uh, we believe they're extremely powerful to study large corpora. Um, and here we wanted to show that they can even be implemented on non-parallel multilingual corpora with the help of uh, machine learn, machine uh, translation. Uh, many, many different types of analysis are, are possible. Topic uh, analysis are one, um, uh, but also you can do many analysis depending on the metadata that you add to the topic analysis. You can do diachronic analysis, journal analysis, author analysis. You can also do conceptual analysis by focusing on specific uh, words. You can do author network analysis and so forth. Um, they're useful. Uh, in a descriptive way that describe the, you know, what, what is in the corpus. Um, they're also useful in a heuristic way, potentially by pointing to uh, areas of uh, worth of further investigation through uh, classical uh, close reading methods, for instance. Uh, I think can also have a justificatory uh, usefulness in the sense that they provide an empirical grounding to um, uh, claims that may otherwise be quite informal. So with that, let me thank uh, my co-author, Francis uh, Laro, the um, uh, Martin Leonard who uh, designed the website and uh, two other students uh, here who helped with uh, German and Dutch uh, text, as well with publishers, institutions, and the funding agencies. Fantastic, thanks so much. Uh, questions have been absolutely pouring in, so I'm gonna get right to it. So this is, there are, there are 11 in the, in the, uh, in the Q&A box. So I'll even, I'll even preemptively ask you to, to, to try to be a little quick so we can see if we can get through them all. Um, top question should be, should be fast enough is, uh, is uh, top of the questions from me. So just to be clear, those error and improvement rate estimates that you were mentioning, that's just, you had people manually sit, sit and read through a selection of, of these articles, right? Correct. Okay. Um, and someone else, uh, uh, Rose Travis also mentioned a comment to that question. So how, in some cases were you evaluating, I mean, the question of translation error can be kind of difficult in a philosophical context, right? Knowing what the right translation is. 
um, were they all pretty obvious or were there some judgment no. calls? No, no, they were, they're not obvious. And it's, uh, you know, it's more to get an, um, an order of magnitudes of uh, where we were, because we, um, we did a, uh, with some code, we were able to assess the, you know, the total number of question marks that were uh, eliminated through the machine translation. So that gave us an indication that yes, machine translation eliminated a lot of the question marks, but did it really improve the text? So this is where we had to look at some of the details somehow. Um, and so what was really easy was, the, um, uh, was to track problems in the original text that were corrected. You know, a question mark inserted in the middle of the text because it was a, um, uh, an encoding issues and that was eliminated in the translation. That was most of the time non-ambiguous at all. Um, the uh, translation mistakes was more difficult. You know, uh, the one I showed, uh, someone could say, well, yes, it's, it, it's not exactly the same word, so therefore the meaning is going to be different. Uh, but we were, um, I'd say, uh, conservative, uh, I, I would feel. So uh, we probably attributed more error translations to Google Translate um, than would, would be meaningful. But the key point was that uh, you know, by looking at these uh, uh, ex excerpts, uh, these randomly chosen excerpts, we were able to really understand where the machine translations did, did some improvements and potentially where it introduced some, uh, some, uh, some, some mistakes. But the numbers that we measured manually, you know, they're just made on, like, on, on some sample text and they're just, I would say, order of magnitude, so. Sure, sure. All right. Uh, next, uh, next question from uh, Stefan Hesperigen, who asks: uh, Be curious whether there were any papers containing none, or at least not not highly representing any of the of the twenty five topics. So, for example, uh, wondering about the apparent absence of chemistry, right, in the in the topic model. Sorry, uh, what about chemistry? Well, so that it, there's not really a topic for chemistry. So, is there a way to look at papers? With, were there were there some papers that seem to not be uh, a very carry a very strong signal for any of the topics uh, in the topic model? Did you did you see any that? Yes, but I mean, uh, uh, it's true that the uh, topic distribution per uh, per article is not necessarily can be a bit flat, but the uh, Typically, the LDA tends to um, uh, arrange, make it so that, that there, there are typically some topics are more represented in, in, uh, in, in articles. So for instance, chemistry would be in the particles, what we call particles, because there is talk about uh, atoms, about molecules. Um, so look, you know, looking at the details of that particular topic, you would find articles on, on, uh, in chemistry. Uh, but we did not uh, look systematically at all articles that would have a rather flat distribution uh, of, uh, of topics. No. Okay, uh, next question coming in. Yeah, so uh, have you evaluated other methods? So why the choice to use traditional uh, a bag of words representations instead of some, for example, uh, transformer embeddings that might seem a bit more context aware that, that would be kind of in line with some of the other ideas that are, that are in the talk? Um, Again, here are the, uh, the, the LDA worked really, very well. We didn't see the need to, uh, to do some, uh, uh, to, to implement some more uh, sophisticated word embedding, uh, type machine learning type of, uh, type of tool here. The, the, I'd say the advantage of the uh, vanilla LDA is that this is very, it's a complex, it's complex somehow, but compared to others, it's still a very simple algorithm. It's very well proven. It's been used in many different studies. So, in terms of you know uh, acceptance, it's extremely well accepted by uh, other scholars. The um, point also is that we had done previously the study using the LDA, uh, uh, the original LDA. So we wanted to be consistent to be able to compare. And the other point is that uh, De Vries, when they um, tested machine translation and topic modeling on parallel corpora also used um, uh, the original vanilla uh, LDA. And we wanted to be able to compare our results to their results also, or to contribute to the same type of uh, work here. So this is where we didn't look further, but we, I mean, on, the, on our, we tested on our computers, different types of models, um, uh, uh, different ways of doing topic modeling. We didn't like a, um, 
even the diachronic ones, we didn't, I mean, they were, there, there are some uh, probably improvements, but they're, I don't think, I don't think they're very significant improvements, um, uh, but maybe, yeah, maybe some like word embeddings could be used for other studies, but we did, we chose not to here for the reasons I just uh, mentioned. Sure, sure. Uh, next, next up, a really great question from uh, Susan Hunston, who will be our, our keynote speaker tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, uh, at the start of the start of the day, tomorrow. So, how would you assess the potentially negative impact on the discipline of philosophy of science of the move toward publishing only or mainly in English? Is there a way to approach that question with with this kind of analysis? Um... Uh, this is not something that is shown in the uh, in, in the topic model. So, um, what you know, there are things that the topic model uh, shows um, certain trends. Now, the trends, it's you know, the trends that we observe um, are not necessarily caused by a shift to English only, right? So uh, we have to be careful here. We only observe certain you know distribution of uh, probabilities, but we do not have access to the uh, causes behind the shifts that we uh, that we see. This is something that would need to be investigated, and the field is actually much more complex, you know, also than than these um, uh, eight journals that we have selected. So um, uh, there is only so much that we can say about um, uh, you know diachronic changes. Um, probably what we can say is that there was a style of doing philosophy uh, uh, pre-World War II or even up to the 1950s or 60s that changed afterwards. Um, um, uh, uh, I'm not sure it was uh, only because it was uh, uh, in English, connected in English. Uh, we would have to see if the similar changes uh, would be the case in, let's say, French-only corpora or German-only corpora. Um, uh, but that did change. And, and here are some other authors, um, uh, like uh, uh, Richardson, for instance, have, uh, or, or Geary, have proposed the, the fact that the, uh, you know, the field has professionalized itself also. And therefore, it, 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 okay, it went through a transformation, a significant transformation phase. Um, and that was probably a very significant factor um, uh, in, 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 in the change that we observed in the topic distribution. Uh, together with editorial uh, policies, let's let's be clear, because editorial policies have a strong impact that we see not on the overall diachronic picture, but that we see on the uh, journal profiles. Right? Great, um, thanks. Now, uh, back to some more technical questions. So, um, Eugenio Petrovich, actually, our next speaker asks, uh, did you uh, experiment with other distance measures in addition to Euclidean distance, uh, cosine distance, for example? Yes, we did. We did similar results. Cool. All right. And, and a... so for so we use the uh, Euclidean distance here for consistency throughout. But there was um, uh, the um, yeah the results were similar, especially for the uh, for the topic to topic uh, you know uh, previous topic to the new topic uh, similarity measures where we use the uh, here the Euclidean distance. Um, uh, we did this uh, on their word vectors, but we also did this on their distribution on the di distribution patterns over uh, uh, over articles, and the results were also similar. Not not exactly the same, but very very similar. So that didn't change. Great, great, thanks. Um, Question from, from Luca Rivelli. Uh, oh, this is cool. So what about measuring topology preservation on a machine translated text, on a, a, a round trip machine translation text from, from, from the original language out and back? Did you, uh, did you mess with that at all? As, uh... no. <laughs> no, we, did, we didn't do that. We could, we, we could do that. Um, we thought about, uh, uh, you know, taking the English text through uh, translation and um, uh, to another language and back, um, especially because we found out that some of the uh, also er, or earlier publications in English also included uh, some question marks, some OCR or uh, including issues, but much much fewer than the uh, than in German or in, in in French. But we didn't do that. Uh, what, what we thought would be really interesting would be to do the pre topic preservation test on the corpus of De Vries, let's say on the European Parliament corpus. Because there, 
there is a uh, gold standard translation and also uh, a machine translation. But um, to implement the topic preser top topology preservation test, we would need to have access to the entire uh, raw corpus. Um, and, you know, we didn't have access, we didn't ask for, uh, for uh, having access, but that would be interesting. Because in that particular case, we would be able to have the results of the topology preservation test together uh, with also their own metrics um, on this on similarity that they be implemented, uh, but on they did this, their similarity metrics uh, that they implemented was between the machine translation and the human translation in English. So they were both, you know, they were comparing English to English, machine translation to uh, uh, expert translation, uh, but they were not comparing machine translation or uh, their uh, expert translation to the uh, original text. And this is where the topology preservation test uh, does. Sure, sure. Okay, next, uh, ah, a question about, about uh, uh, cleaning from uh, uh, Stefan Reiner Selbach, who asks, uh, did you look into some, uh, some of the newer methods? Uh, I was actually Googling this during the talk, uh, uh, machine learning methods like the Python library autocorrect to parse through some of these OCR errors sort of as typos as a pre-processing step. Um, we, we looked at them uh, uh, a posteriori, <laughs> uh, but we did not implement them. We just found out actually uh, there was a bit of, uh, uh, unfortunate, but we found out about the, the uh, errors and the, the, the amount of errors uh, somehow afterwards and uh, through the translation and found out that the machine translation corrected a lot of them. But of course, there are many uh, tools that are available to, uh, to patch these, uh, these, these, these issues. Um, but we thought that was something you know, interesting to point out this was somehow our initial mistake not to have found out about this earlier, but on the other hand, we found out something that machine translation was able to fix it uh, quite significantly uh, also. And in, other way, and in ways that then would um, actually be uh, very satisfying for uh, bag of word approaches or even more uh, than bag of word approaches. But yes, they are, thank you for pointing this. There are other methods for correcting these issues. That's that's really funny. One of these uh, cases of serendipitous discovery from these yeah, from these yeah. tools. Yeah. Um, question from uh, Stefan Linquist, who asks. Uh, so I'm curious about the, the methodological question of how to settle on a number of topics. So I know that interpretability is important, but are there advantages perhaps to presenting one's results at multiple levels of grain? Yes, uh, you could you could do that. Uh, um, and this is what we're thinking about doing with a tool that we showed online, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the web-based visualization. The thing is, um, a topic model is already extremely rich in the amount of information. Um, and if you show two topic models at different scales, then, you know, you need to explain even much more and potentially you need to investigate much more. Um, or uh, you need then to do a high level, I mean, a, a very fine grained topic model to explore only some very specific topics. Um, and this is something that we've done, for instance, when we, uh, we did a uh, topic model of um, over hundred topics of uh, just the journal philosophy of science. Uh, and when you do this, you see some, you know, very fine grained topics that are really about, um, uh, for instance, some, uh, uh, some models of explanation. So you see the uh, a topic about, for instance, the uh, how the, uh, uh, DN model, Hempel's DN model uh, developed uh, at, uh, you know, in, in the 50s, 60s, and then uh, its popularity went down. And then there, are, uh, there is another topic about uh, much more general uh, causal modeling and, and that, that uh, goes up and then goes a bit down. And then there is another one that goes up all the uh, uh, mechanistic um, model of explanation that goes up uh, the start in the you know, two, late 1990s, 2000 you know, and, and uh, is still on, on the rise. Um, so you see this type of details. So uh, I would recommend to do a, a fine grain topic modeling. If you want that particular type of detail, uh, if you want to investigate, for instance, uh, what were the different research topics in philosophy of science concerning, um, you know, say explanations or, or models or um, uh, concerning causation, for instance, uh, and then which were the uh, some of the key articles that appeared at uh, at which uh, at which point in, in time um, that you can you, you can really do but presenting simultaneously you know fine grain and a coarse grain is also possible but you need 
a, a mapping tool somehow to be able to investigate, you know, see all the details and, and find out uh, what is really interesting in each one of these models. Uh, so they do not lend themselves to publication in traditional or, you know, traditional articles form. There isn't. That, yes, that I, 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 I can imagine and have some experience, yes. Um, Question coming in from, from uh, Arlie Bellevue, who writes, uh, do you have any plans to test this with uh, non-European languages? Do you know of any corpora that might be available for that? Um, I haven't, uh, we haven't planned to do it. I'd be very, um, uh, very happy to, uh, to, to, to know that others uh, would, would like to do it. Uh, we, we don't, we, we, I mean, we know that some uh, uh, multilingual, um, you know, topic modeling have been done also on non, uh, Occidental uh, uh, languages, um, but, but we haven't done it ourselves. Okay. Um, another question from uh, another question from uh, Gino Petrovich who asks: uh, Did you check the overlap between the sets of authors for each journal? Some kind of way to measure that as a as a as a quantitative analysis. Uh, no, we did. We uh, this is a good uh, this is a good point. Um, we did not implement, no, we did not implement a metric to do this uh, systematically. Uh, but some things could be seen already in, you know, in this um, hierarchical diagrams here. You see one figure here, Carnap, just appears in philosophy of science. And this is the late Carnap in the, you know, 1930s after he immigrated typically to uh, the United States and before he, he, was, he was here. Right. So uh, you, you see some of the overlaps here, but um, uh, you see it um, uh, qualitatively. So we did not um, implement a metric, but that would be something good to do. Yeah. We ha you have to be aware that working on authors is um, um, needs uh, still a lot of work, needed a lot of curation work because authors may be spelled differently in different articles. And also you have the problems of uh, multi uh, authorship, multiple authorship. Uh, so it needs a, yeah, needs a lot of work. Sure, sure. Um, actually, hang on, I'm going to, I'm going to piggyback there for a clarification question. So for these diagrams, did you guys actually sit down? I mean, I guess that's why the time period's a little delimited as well. Did you guys actually yes. sit down and clean these author lists by hand? Correct. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's, yeah, that's a lot. Um, <laughs> that's a lot. Um, one last question from uh, from Stefan Hesburgh, and so uh, we actually have, we, we we might have time for one more if somebody wants to add one more into the box. Um, so regarding monographs versus journal articles, uh, do you think there's some way to uh, to produce an estimate of how of how both forms of publication might have developed during the period in question? Hmm. How would you have access? I mean, having access to the journals, there are ways of doing it. Having access to the um, to the monographies in uh, or edited volumes, uh, you that would be, I think, quite a lot of work. I don't see, you know, out of like this spontaneously any uh, easy solution to do this. And, um, something like Google Scholar, maybe, or a search on uh, Book Finder. Uh, database uh, because they're multilingual um, to be able to retrieve uh, then that would be a massive amount of work to be able to not only retrieve the uh, you know, the titles and all the publications but also retrieve the content of them to be able to sift through that um, it's a uh, computationally also that would be something uh, something quite sig significant um, but it's true i mean you really here we would need to have a, a view of also what is happening in the you know in the in the uh, in this um, uh, book portion of the uh, of the philosophy of science. But unfortunately, I don't have any easy solution. So if you have one, I'd be really happy to hear about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's always it's a there's always a data access question here. Um, with that, I think let me let me uh, let me let the broadcast catch you up a little bit and see if anyone has one final question. If you have a quick one, we could get it in. We have a minute left in the time slot. This was actually quite nice. We've lined up very well. Um, failing that, let me go ahead and 
yeah, let me go ahead and thank everybody. I think we'll call it there. So that's that's very nice, very nice on timing. Thanks very much. This was a, this was a fantastic talk. Uh, you you can go back and look at the chat later. That's been it's been active, and everybody is uh, passing on many thanks. Uh, so yeah. fantastic, fantastic stuff. And I'm looking forward to being able to uh, to play with that website at some point too. So that's gonna be that's gonna be really Absolutely. fun. Uh, exactly. Thank you again, uh, Charles and, uh, and Luca. Oh, you're very, you're very welcome. We're very happy that, uh, that everything's been going so well. So we'll be back in five minutes with our next talk. Thanks very much.